today Alyssa and I are searching for owls and hopefully we find some. A very strong possibility is a long-eared owl. 50-50 chance might be uh, the northern Sawe owl. We just have to try. We're gonna go through five main points that you have to keep in mind while owling. So what is the first point? The first point is to do research before you even start. I think that it's important to know what the owl looks like, what kind of habitat it lives in, where you might see it so you know what you're looking for and where you're looking for it. You gotta learn where they hide and how they hide because they hide differently, you know, um, certain ones you'd never see in a coniferous tree, whereas others, that's exactly where they will be roosting during the day. This is prime long-eared owl habitat. There could be sawettes in the cedars. One thing I'm gonna add though, I recently found a long-eared owl in this actual park and it actually caught me off guard because it was not in a tree that I was expecting it to be in. So basically what you're saying is that sometimes they might be found in habitats that are unexpected. People are shocked by the size of some birds. Some owls are a lot larger than you expect and I think many are quite small, the long-eared owl in particular. The first time I ever saw one, I was very shocked because I was expecting something the size of a great horned owl um, and they're much smaller. So I think that if you have a relative size, idea of what it looks like and where it's going to be, then you're gonna be more successful. We're searching all of these trees, all these evergreen trees, the thick canopy. When you're owling, you wanna be quiet because you could scare them away. But most of all, you just wanna be very, very thorough in how you search. You wanna search every single little nook and cranny of every single branch on a tree because the owl is going to be sitting still as can be. It will not be moving at all like most diurnal birds. You know, if you miss one spot in the tree, that could be that one spot that that owl was roosting. So I climb this tree to see what's inside. That next, bleh, sorry, my face is frozen. I climb this tree to see what's inside this nest box. So one other thing that is huge when looking for owls is patience. Sorry, I can't really talk that well because my, my mouth and my cheeks are being frozen right now because it's like 20 degrees Fahrenheit. We've been out here for an hour in freezing cold weather. We've been sticking it out, searching tree by tree, branch by branch and we're ready to do it for a few more hours. You've gone owling all day, right? Like eight hours, still not even yeah, gotten an Yeah, you owl. can go for a whole day and not see any. You just can't be discouraged. You have to just do it again. And eventually it will pay off, especially if um, you use some apps like eBird to help you look in places where owls have been seen, just because then at least you know there's one there, so it's giving you a little bit of a head start. But yeah, you just have to keep persisting. In the winter time, actually, there's less vegetation, at least in the temperate region of North America, <laughs> heavily forested places. Generally, it's easier, it's even easier for me to focus because there's generally less species of birds around, especially, obviously, the migratory birds, so it's easier to focus on just looking for the <laughs> owls. Thing about owling is it's not like other types of birding where you go out into the field you see what you can see it's a ton of work for one huge reward i think that most people agree that finding an owl is one of the coolest experiences that you can get while birding so believe me it's worth the effort dogs baby all the dogs Hi. oh my god you're so little what's one of the greatest things of birding all the dogs i see an owl right now no you don't and obviously look for the clues things like owl pellets white washes we can look for a white wash which is basically it's owl excretions on the branches and along the tree trunk there'll be a lot of it you'll see it sort of like speckled 
you can see the whitewash on the cedar leaves here, like the speckling, that's what you'll see. Um, depending how high the owl is, there might be a lot of that throughout the whole center of the tree, but that's a really good way to know. And then obviously this mess on the ground here. You can also look for pellets. So a pellet is basically regurgitated fur and bones. So whatever prey they ate that can't be digested. So they throw it up, spit it out. And you can tell basically if the spot you found is a recent earth or not by how fresh the pellet is. Some of them could be very fresh, like just coughed up, or some could be like dried out, which you know that's an older pellet. So it could tell you, you know, like an owl hasn't been here in a while. This one is a fresher one. You can tell because it looks like almost like it's wet. That one is fresh right there. Yeah, this one is fresher than let's say this one here, which looks a lot more dried out. So you can that tell one's that, dried out. Yeah, so you can tell that that one's older. And you can also tell what kind of owl you're dealing with based on the size of the pellet. So you can see the mice teeth right here. Yeah. You sure there's a mice teeth? I think so. Okay. What kind of biologist are you? You just tear it open with your hands. I actually have touched them with my hands before, but- But you should they, always wash your hands no matter you what. You should always wash your hands. And yeah, I'll touch them. Yeah, in your face. I'm the one who's touching them. She's not touching them. <laughs> allowed to be a girl sometimes. Once in a while, I could be girly. Maybe I don't want to touch the thrown up owl guts. Oh, wait. This is facing me. Eddie is opening up Ooh, one of these. It's basically frozen. This one's frozen, so that's another indicator it's probably old. And this so. one I can break open a little bit. There we go. What do we got in here? Look at that. We got some more bones in there. Wow. Imagine eating this, all of this, and then having to cough it back up. Something else you can look for um, is feathers. You'll find primary feathers, secondary feathers, often around where owls sit and roost, I guess if they're preening, feathers fall out. And you'll also see downy fluffy feathers. It's not always necessarily an owl. If you have other signs like pellets and whitewash, then you can just reiterate to yourself that you're in the right space. You know, sometimes owls might be vocal, but- uh... Typically only when they're mating um, or protecting their territory. I have never personally heard um, an owl ever make a sound because I find them during daytime to roost. It kind of depends what time you're owling, if you're owling at night or if you're owling during the day. Um, at night can be tough because they're hunting, a lot of them, not all of them, some owls are diurnal, like snowy owls will hunt during the day, but there are a lot of owls that do not hunt during the day and they only hunt at night. It's a different type of owling, um, they're not going to be in one spot, so uh, there's definitely a whole different set of skills that go into owling at nighttime. Just got up, something's wrong I waited up with wounds on my feet We found the long-eared owl Flickering through memories The Polaroids yellowed in the sun Longing to be seen So come on. We both found pellets at the same time under yeah. the same tree yeah. And then I looked behind Eddie and I was like, don't move and there's a long-eared owl right behind, uh, right in front of us. He's so gorgeous, so I want to get some footage. It's just an amazing experience being this close to such a special wild animal. I don't even think I've ever seen a long-eared owl in my life. Uh, somehow I've gone through my whole life without seeing a long-eared owl. And she's laughing at me. It's a lifer for Eddie. It's a, it's a lifer for me. Owls have something about them that are just so magical that you can't explain. Maybe it's from our pop culture. Maybe it's because of Harry Potter and yeah. fantasy tales. Owls just carry such a mystique. You don't get the same surreal feeling that you do looking at an owl when you look at other birds. It's just so cool to see this guy. It's worth all the work it takes to find them. It took us what, like two hours? Yeah, two hours. You know, we knew they were here. Exactly, so it took two hours, but I knew they're here and I know where they like to sit and roost. Yeah. Not so specifically, but we knew which park they were in. I was right there just walking through right in front of the tree that the owl's in and she told me to stop and be quiet. I said, stop. And I made him come towards me instead of going past it because I was afraid that we would spook it and I didn't want to flush it. You just want to get close to it and see it and you're like, where is it? I don't see it. But I've learned it from experience that get away from it a bit and then figure out how to approach it without spooking it.
Sometimes maybe you need a challenge, so I would highly recommend trying owling. You're kind of playing hide and go seek, <laughs> except you're the one who's always doing the seeking. I think that aspect of it can actually make owling a lot more fun uh, compared to just normal birding. So yeah, we were just driving on this highway about a half an hour away from the Salton Sea and Alyssa saw something hop down from a pile of hay and it turned out to be a burrowing owl. So we're gonna try to get a little bit of a closer look here. Burrowing owl, I spotted it. You spotted it? I did. You got your burrowing owl. Woo you got your burrowing owl. many burrowing owls. So many. It's hard to say if we'll actually get to the Salton Sea at any point during today. The final point that we'll have just gets into the etiquette. Part of that is when you spot an owl, just be very quiet and approach it very conservatively because if you go right up to an owl and are really loud, you could force it to fly away. And what happens when you flush out an owl? Uh, multiple things happen. Usually it gets seen by small birds, even chickadees and nuthatches. At least here in Canada, they will harass owls they make it known that the owl is there which makes it a difficult for the owl to rest which also you being in its face for too long also makes it difficult for it to rest if it's not hunting it's trying to sleep um, and they also bring attention to it so all the other predators around all the other small birds around anything it might be hunting know it's there now larger hawks larger owls anything basically larger than it that's a bird of prey will hunt it most important thing is being quiet and trying to keep a distance yes sometimes you accidentally flush one because you didn't even know it was there but if that happens don't chase it down and corner it again because obviously it's nervous most of them are sensitive species so you don't want to flush them out another way that it's possible to flush out owls and birds in general is by playing their playbacks people have done that to get the owl to come towards them to get a better look at it what's your suggestion on on doing playbacks definitely not during the daytime when they're roosting basically if an owl's roosting it's trying to sleep so you should not be bothering it. Photographing it's not necessarily bothering it. Pulling its call back and harassing it is definitely bothering it. Typically with owl calls, it's done often at night when like a species that hunt at night are hunting or during mating season, to be honest. A lot of them will call back if they're, if they're trying to find a mate. It's generally not a good idea to do it in excess anyway so you know you get the owl to call back it flies in during like nighttime that's great you saw it it called back don't bother it any more than that and also uh, when you do post it to citizen science specifically ebird or just you know any post on any facebook or social media it's obviously totally cool to disclose the general location of it but to disclose the specific place within like, you know, 10 feet of, of where it was, there's really no reason to do that. I think if anyone wants to see an owl that bad, then the challenge is up to them, you know, because the last thing you want to do is have 100 people show up surrounding an owl. Ch the chances of someone disturbing it and flushing it out is, is way more. Yeah. And also on eBird. Species, like sensitive species, um, like great gray owls, they will not show you their locations. Yeah. Um, so a good rule of thumb is a lot of people will wait a little bit of time. So if they see an owl today like we did, we don't post it for like a week. Um, I also find sometimes pictures are very, depending where the owl is, a picture can be basically giving away its specific location. So if you think your photo is showing something, like maybe there's like a sign nearby that's in the background, you know, maybe don't post that picture. And yeah, unfortunately, owls are harassed and owls are baited, which is even worse. People use um, either live or dead mice or whatever um, to bait the owls for photographs and it's just like not good practice. These animals are wild, they need to know how to hunt and they need yeah. to not they need to be afraid of people and that makes them not afraid of people. So. Yeah, for some species of owls, actually baiting is used in a very special protocol for monitoring their population numbers. 
that scientists actually use, but those are very special protocols. For owls, you should never bait an owl for recreational reasons ever. Do you have anything else? No. Well, anyways, guys, thank you very much. If you guys want more videos giving tips on bird watching, wildlife photography, exploring the natural world, subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications. And I hope to catch you guys birding sometime soon.